to appealing. Get me out. And the perils of extreme cold. I'm actually losing concentration, actually. The sea can be a dangerous place, but when you're on a big ship, a ferry or a cruise liner, you hardly expect it simply to sink underneath your feet. But that's exactly what happened to the 581 passengers and crew on the cruise ship Oceanus that went down off South Africa in 1991. What you're about to see is a story based on real footage that's never been seen before on British television. <laughs> Husband and wife singers Moss and Tracy Hills felt at home on board the Oceanus, a good time ship. It was often used as a venue for parties and weddings. So as the entertainment staff got things ready for the opening night's party, no one worried about the storm that was battering South Africa's east coast. There was a great atmosphere when we set sail. It's kind of typical. There's always people are partying. It's a whole sail away party. It's one of the, the highlights of a cruise. I went upstairs to go and check on our musical equipment. And on my way up there, I saw three security guards running down the passageway. So I followed them and saw crew members packing their bags and everyone was in a real state of panic. I knew something was wrong. I then went up to the lounge and then suddenly the power went off. The captain ordered the crew to prepare to launch the lifeboats, but the message never reached the passengers. Just before the power outage, I'd heard a sort of a dull thump. The pounding of the giant waves meant that by 10 o'clock the ship was breaking up. Unknown to the passengers, the ship's lower decks were flooded. So I ran up to the bridge and got the shock of my entire life because the staff captain was shouting into emergency radio, Mayday, 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 this is the Ojeanos, Mayday, Mayday, you know, and I'm like standing there and going, uh, is this for real? First of all, I got my video camera and so I walked right forward, walked down the stairs and I could hear water and I started filming and I did a voiceover. I'm right down below now. There's water everywhere. And then one of the crew members started shouting at me from, from behind. No, no video, no, no, no. No, video on I went and found the cruise director and I said, we are sinking. Unbelievably, the senior crew had already jumped ship. And next thing we just sort of started running everything. It was myself and Julian and the cruise director, my wife Tracy, and we were getting people and just loading them into lifeboats. And then the ship was starting to list more and more onto the starboard side and it's becoming harder and harder to walk on the floors. The lifeboats on the port side wouldn't go down, they wouldn't launch because they're stuck on the side of the ship. By 4 a.m., 350 people, including the crew, had got off, leaving the entertainers in charge of the frightened passengers. We had just over 200 people still left on board and nowhere to get off, we had no more lifeboats. So we went up to the bridge and there was no one there. So we just started to make calls on the radio. Like a movie, you know? Mayday, Mayday, Mayday. Water continued to pour through the hull, but the gravity of the situation was kept from the passengers to avoid panic. I remember sitting, just waiting for helicopters to arrive, and passengers then get a bit stressed out. When people are sitting around and nothing's happening, that's when tensions can go. And we weren't sure how, how close we were to sinking completely. I think because we were keeping ourselves fairly positive. And also, I'm an entertainer, we're used to dealing with people. Everyone just looked to us to, to see the whole thing through. So I went on and I filled my pockets with sweets. And then I'd like, give people, adults, anyone would give them sweets. You'd think of anything as a little angle to distract people. Eight hours had passed since the lights went out and still there was no sign of help. Each wave tore deeper into the ship's damaged hull. But the captain's early mayday had been heard. And as the ship wallowed in the boiling ocean, the largest air sea rescue in history was about to begin. It was almost exactly midnight when the telephone rang. By the time we got all the aeroplanes up and ready and with divers and with the uh, medical personnel and with the fuel etc on board, the first helicopters got there just as dawn was breaking around about six o'clock in the morning. We thought we need to get these passengers out of the lounge because if the ship rolls over they're going to get caught and everyone's going to drown. So we got them out onto the decks then and said, look, you all need to go outside. And they're all just hanging onto something and just all on the deck, just waiting for the helicopters. By now, the ship was listing alarmingly in the water. 
leaving terrified passengers clinging on for their lives. Swinging uncontrollably in gale force winds, two Navy divers were dropped on board the ship to assist with the rescue. Once I was on deck, I went up with the first passenger just to show everybody once, and from then on, everyone was on their own. We sent two people up in the harnesses at a time. 228 was actually the total number of passengers we had, so we split them in half. The Navy divers took about half, and I took about, I'll say, about 110 odd passengers. They worked out a pattern that as soon as they got two passengers in their hoist, they'd pluck them off the deck, they'd move out over the sea so the rest of the hoist would be done over the sea, allowing the next chopper to come in and take its place and pick up the next one. So they had this sort of pattern going. Paul organised the airlift of passengers from one end of the ship with Moss at the other. There was no time to spare. Decks had to be cleared and Moss taught how to fit a harness. And then they said, OK, that's all the training you get. You know, you, we've got to go. And I just was putting them in, into the harnesses. My wife, Tracy, would organise them and feed them out to me two at a time. And she'd just keep an eye on me, see when I needed the passengers to go. As soon as I had two in the harness and ready to go, I'd signal the chopper guys and they'd get the harness would go up and then she'd send the next two out. We had left one entertainer, a magician on the bridge, a guy called Robin, so that we had some kind of radio communication with people. He was sitting up there on the bridge. 11 hours since the alarm was raised, time was running out for those left on board. So I was thinking, which is just happening all too fast. I knew that uh, we would, in my mind, I was 100% sure we'd never make it. It was taking forever. It was really going slowly. As the waters rose up the ship, desperate pilots overloaded their helicopters by five or six people. Even so, it looked like time would beat them. We had 12 passengers left, myself, Tracy, and we had um, Robin was on the bridge. So there was 15 people left on board, and they disappeared to go and drop those passengers off. We were waiting, and we wait, and we wait, and then they didn't come back. After 40 minutes, there was still no sign of a helicopter. Turns out they'd run out of fuel, and, th and there's no fuel available there. As the time was passing, there were less and less folks on the boat, um, and everyone was just uh, waiting, waiting for, for choppers. Having refueled, the helicopters returned, just as Moss was giving up any hope of being rescued. You can really see how what a dangerous situation we're in as we were going up. And I can just see the ship on its side, where we were earlier on, its nose is in the water. Our helicopter flew to the shore to where all the passengers were. We finally landed with the last helicopter, and they also had to get up off the lawn, and all these passengers were saying, thank you so much, and it, it, was, it was overwhelming. I must have been exhausted, I mean, I'd, but it, I just got overwhelmed, and I, I, I just started to, I was welling up my eyes, I started to cry, and I just, cry, and I just collapsed, I just fell on the floor. As we got into the harness and I looked down on the vessel, I was sad to the point where I, you know, I, was, I was emotional. I had a bump in my throat. I was ready. To, you look at the vessel and you think that uh, so much has happened in such a short time, you know, and there's nothing more we could do. There's, there's no way of saving that vessel, no way. I saw her sinking. The fact that we got all the people safely off that ship before it went down was almost a miracle. And I think that. Guiding this miracle, there was a, there was a higher hand, and I'm, I'm convinced of it. A swimming pool only about a metre deep might not seem the most likely place for a dramatic rescue, but that's what happened to nine-year-old Alistair Norwell when he went for a swim at the Thomas Cook Leisure Centre in Peterborough. Now, like most pools, it's got a grill on the bottom that leads to a cleaning filter. Thousands of gallons of water pass through here and into a pipe underneath which narrows, creating an enormous suction. Now, if you were to put your arm in here, when the pool's full of water, of course, the force of the suction would be so great that your arm would be stuck fast and you'd end up completely trapped under the water. Alistair's been swimming since he was about four years old. And he's always been used to water and has always really enjoyed being in the water. Well, 
look happy enough. <laughs> I remember feeling particularly relaxed and really feeling as though I was letting go of the stresses and strains of the working week. Right, I'm off to make the most of it. See you later. I'll keep an eye on you. I remember the day very well. It was cup final day, Chelsea against Middlesbrough. I thought I'd go through to the pool early to let one of the lifeguards go so I could do my stint, come back, finish watching the football. Alistair was in serious trouble. I noticed that the two children were playing and one of them looked to be in difficulty at the bottom. Somehow, Alistair's hand had become trapped in the water filter. He was laying face down, bottom of the pool. His arm was caught in a field duct. Press your lower plates! I thought that maybe the suction was holding it in, along with the pressure of the water. So, um, by this time, Jamie, who was on duty as well, had came onto the pool. It was quite obvious after a few pulls that the arm was going to come out. No, it's not going to come out. I'm going to turn the filters off. OK, mate. Jamie rushed to turn the filter pump off to stop the suction on Alistair's hand. There was an incident previously on 999, which had a, 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 a guy rescue another guy who was trapped in a car underwater. And um, just by breathing underwater, you can keep someone alive for a long time. So I thought he'd been down there a little while so far, and he's still kicking, still moving. So I thought I'd better go down and give him some air. With a conscious person, mouth-to-mouth -mouth is not recommended. It's dangerous. But the situation called for desperate measures. When Jamie came back upstairs, he said the filter was off. Um, and I thought, great, let's try the arm. It'll fire out, no problem. And it just didn't budge again. Uh, the hand must have been stuck fast in the hole. Karen ran up to me, and she was saying that Alistair had his arm stuck in the bottom of the pool. I felt, here comes panic coming down like an avalanche, which is going to come and get me, <laughs> but I've got to get a grip here, because that's not going to help. Everything seemed to be in slow motion, but I was just very clear that I had to really keep control. By now, the emergency services were on their way. The fear was that they'd be too late. It was about three miles away. Uh, we got the call at one minute to three, and we were in attendance by five minutes past, so we took it about six minutes. Jean-Paul had been breathing for Alistair for seven minutes. I just thought if I just keep going and keep going, someone else will come along who's done this before. <laughs> And, and finish the job for me. I didn't, I didn't think we wouldn't get him, but it was beginning to creep in near the end that maybe, maybe we're not going to get him. I'm a, a general practitioner working in Peterborough and also a member of the Mid-Anglia General Practitioner Accident Service. It's about a mile and a half from my house to the, the leisure centre. And obviously, we were going a great deal faster than this. I think on the day, I was doing well over 100 miles an hour although it's not a very long stretch, but it is dual carriageway. The initial reports were that Alistair had been under the water certainly more than 10 minutes and possibly even getting on for 15 minutes. No one was quite clear at the time because of, obviously everything was all happening at once. I hadn't a clue whether Alistair would survive or not. Despite repeated attempts to try and free him, his hand was stuck fast. This is probably the worst part. His eyes were wide open, almost appealing get me out um, and then I could sense him drifting. You can't normally survive underwater for more than three minutes. Alistair by now was deeply unconscious. Jean-Paul didn't know how much air he was able to get into Alistair's lungs. 
it became clear to me, even in my state of anxiety, that a lot of time was passing. And it was vital that Alistair was got out of this pool. Come on, Mum's here, it's gonna be all right. Alistair's head was only about a foot below the surface. Kitchen staff made desperate attempts to try to lower the water level. And I was thinking to myself, that's never gone a drain in time. Why are they doing that? As the time went on, I thought, you know, it's, it's getting a long time now. Where, where are the services? And then the fire service arrived, and they arrived like the cavalry. He'd now been underwater for 15 minutes. We've all got children, and it was especially difficult. The two lads that uh, actually went underwater to rescue Alistair uh, were, were faced with quite a horrific scene underwater. He was trapped by um, his hand in the filter, and they used physical brute force, really, to remove him. His eyes were just fixed, open, so I just covered him up, basically, to protect her. Really. Oh, come on, breathe! Come on. Alistair certainly come on, wasn't breathing, breathe. so we, we put a, the, the bag valve mask apparatus over his, his face to, to ventilate him. We were all determined, particularly with it being a child, particularly with it being a drowning situation, that we'd do everything we could to resuscitate him. And I sat in the changing rooms for about two, three minutes, um, head in my hands, thinking, I think he's dead, you know? It's been so long, I think he's dead. After probably about two or three minutes, he showed some, some signs of, of retching and, and began to vomit and then began to breathe. At that point, I started running around the pool, whooping, yes, yes, yes! <laughs> Feeling quite demented. I knew, yes, you know, he had won, he got his life back. The euthoria was unbelievable. Well, we were all chuffed to bits. And when we got out as well, outside the swimming pool, we were all soaking wet. Um, we stood around and we were just pleased with uh, what we'd actually achieved. Alistair's ordeal wasn't over. He was rushed to Peterborough District Hospital. Doctors there were concerned that Alistair's brain and other vital organs would be severely damaged after his prolonged immersion. He was submerged in warm water, which um, does not protect you like cold water submersion can. And he was submerged for a period of time, which most authorities would agree would lead to significant brain damage, if not irreversible. So you've been resuscitated under the water. Yeah, resuscitated the whole side, Dr. Blatchford. Um, he's on he's has vomited many times in our airway, and he's still coming round a little bit right, now. Right, OK. Can we get some oxygen onto him, please? When we arrived here, we didn't go through the main doors of casualty, right. did we? We came round the back here, and there was an ambulance here. And the back so, door was open. And we went through to find where Alistair was. Hi, you with Alistair? Yes, Let's we are. Let's just take him to the relatives room, and I'll explain what's happening to can him, and then you can see him. OK, and we'll get one of the doctors to come and have a chat as well. And they stopped us here and took us through those doors into that waiting room. That's right. In a way, this is where Alistair's accident started to become a reality. What I would like to say is, although he is quite stable at the moment, it's going to be a little while before we know whether there has been any um, damage to his lungs or, in, or to his brain from the lack of oxygen that he suffered during the drowning incident. The next 48 hours would be critical. His oxygen levels deteriorated okay. further and it required us to uh, put a breathing tube into his uh, windpipe and to connect him to a life support machine. That's when I felt, felt, started to feel really quite frightened and it started to hit me exactly mm. what had been said. We were talking to him, but we were praying a lot in his ear. Yeah. Sitting beside him, holding his hand. But he Mom did look quite peaceful. Mum and Daddy here now, it's going to be fine. Despite the doctor's He's worst like, fears, oh, Alistair went on to make a full recovery. Oxygen. So um, that's the tube that's in his mouth. 
the efforts of the lifeguards must have contributed to, to this recovery. Uh, it's difficult to see how you can survive 30 minutes of no oxygen and have a normal recovery. Uh, I think Alistair is an extremely fortunate young boy. I like swimming a lot. Swim quite far. Yes, you swim about half a mile now. Okay. All right, a mile, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and you like diving on the bottom of the pool. Retrieve things, don't you? Yeah. As soon as we got him home and relaxing, he was talking about when am I going to go swimming. He was insistent that I was worrying and he would be absolutely fine. And when we arrived outside the pool, he uh, let out a whoop of joy because he was going swimming. And uh, when we got in there, he just walked around and dived in the deep end and swam around and waved and said, I told you so. And he's been absolutely fine ever since. Monday at nine, exclusive to Really. Hypothermia, exposure to extreme cold, kills more than 200 people every year. The temperature inside your body, your core temperature, has only to fall by two degrees centigrade before hypothermia begins. What if you find yourself stuck in a remote place in freezing weather with no protective clothing? What does it feel like as your body gets colder and colder? How does it affect your judgment? In this week's 999 demonstration, we're going to put our stuntman, Mark Cass, outside in the middle of winter. We want to see how he copes as the temperature inside his body falls towards the threshold of hypothermia. In this sort of weather, the cold and wind are potentially lethal. Drivers often forget to travel with proper winter clothing, and if you get stuck in the snow, hypothermia is a real threat. We're staging a controlled experiment to find out what happens as you develop hypothermia. This is Aviemore in Scotland. We're exposing Mark to the sort of conditions that many of us might consider OK. It's January, but it's two degrees above freezing with no wind chill. However, he's only wearing a pair of jeans and a T-shirt. How will he cope? It's going to be interesting, you know. I suppose I'm really going to see how big a wimp I am because, you know, it's, it's just going to be... I imagine it's going to be really painful. Uh, what, the, three three right medical right specialists here. will monitor Mark's progress yeah. and tell us how far it's safe to go. They're wiring him up with sensors to measure his temperature and heartbeat. They'll stop the experiment if Mark is in danger. He'll be all right, don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> and how accurate are these machines when we make? This, this stuff's quite accurate. Mm. It, it'll measure the temperature to a tenth of a degree centigrade. Right. Mm. As his temperature drops, Mark's body will try and protect him against the cold. First, the blood supply to his skin will shut down to conserve heat. And another defence mechanism is shivering, where muscles contract against each other, generate heat, uh, and, and would potentially warm Mark up. Right, core temperature now is 36.8, 36.7. That's, so that's only three minute little dots down from the, the normal. core temperature, the body temperature, must stay within a, a very short range. Otherwise, the body will then malfunction and, and can cause death. The doctors have two simple tests to see how Mark's mental and physical abilities change when he gets cold. I'm going to ask you to count back in sevens from right. a given number. We'll start with uh, 178. 178. So, so if minus in seven, and I'll speak into here, yes. yeah? OK. Uh, 178, 171, 164... As people get cold, they often make, can make mistakes with numbers. And if you're out on those hills in the mist and made a slight error of calculation of, say, two degrees in your compass heading, could mean that you're heading straight over a cliff instead of along the flat. And then people say, oh, just an error. You went over a cliff, but the error was caused by being cold. 17, 10, 3. OK? Yeah. Great. OK. We've now got that so we can check if you've made any mistakes. And this is the other one. Right, so undo it and then put it back. Yes, just so we're going to OK, it. and you want me to do it as quickly as possible, yes. right? OK. Ready, 
Go. Right. This is a medical torch. Mark's never seen one before. But if you're caught out in the cold, your ability to operate a fiddly object like a torch or compass might save your life. Batteries back in. Right, got that bit in. I don't know if I got lucky there, but there yeah. you go. Excellent. Well played. Well done. 39 seconds. Wow. It's a target for you to beat later. Okay. Imagine Mark has broken down in a remote place. We've started the clock on the experiment. How long will it be before he begins to suffer the effects of the cold if he's outside the car? We're using a special heat-sensitive camera. The white areas are hotter, the dark regions colder. And when the heart monitor goes crazy, it shows that Mark is shivering badly. <laughs> well, we can see it beginning occasional shivering coming yeah. up on this trace. And well, there's a good shiver going now. Oh, I can feel that cold on my back now. It quickly becomes obvious that leaving your car is the worst thing you can do. Mark, what, what are your coldest bits just now? Coldest bits, I have to say, would be hands. Uh, chest is feeling quite cold. Um, I find that, like, my, my muscles are really tense around my chest, you know, like it's trying to fight the cold. Yeah, right. Your jeans are about the same colour as your head and your hands, which means that they are pro providing very little thermal protection. Right. Your top half, there is a bit of darker shadow. Of course, your head is pure white, except for three black dots. Right. Your <laughs> nose and your two ears. <laughs> when you turn sideways, if to the thermal camera, you you can see the blackness of the ear. Right. Yeah. So yeah. those are the those are the places that you would be most vulnerable to frostbite. Yeah. Yeah. But um, obviously, my body's more concerned about my brain keeping warm rather than my ears and the tips of my nose. Yes. <laughs> Mark's beginning to suffer, although his core temperature has only fallen by half a degree. How will he do in the mental and physical tests? Right, ready? Okay. Go. Go. Oh. <laughs> oh. How does that thing come on? Yeah, my thumb's not really working properly. It's broken. <laughs> Imagine trying to fix a torch or operate a compass at this stage. Oh. <sighs> yes. It's on. Yes. Okay. And I, I think I held my breath for about two <laughs> minutes there uh, trying to do that. Two minutes, 18 seconds. That's nearly three times longer than when he did the test inside. Again, 176, 169, 162, 155, 148, 141, 134, 127, 15, 8, 1. And on the mental test, he took twice as long as the first time. It was, uh, felt slower again, yeah. yeah. I'll time it when yeah. I get up. Yeah, even like really simple ones got a bit confusing there. <laughs> if you look at his hands, they're, um, they're virtually black. That demonstrates the circulation to the hands is virtually minimal, and he's appreciating this now. Temperature's gone down to the lowest yet now which is uh, 36.4 degrees. So it's, it's gone down six, I know. 0 0.6. 0 0.6, yeah. yeah. 0 0.6, which doesn't sound a lot, but I promise you it feels a lot, <laughs> yeah. Mark, how are you feeling now? I'm starting another set of uh, shivers at the moment. Yeah, we've got that so, in the uh, screen can't just really, now. can't really talk very well when I'm shivering. But I'm, I'm actually losing concentration, actually, when I, when I talk to, to anyone as well. Many people may try to walk to get help. So that's what we asked Mark to do. We wanted to see if it altered Mark's core temperature. This is where decision-making is affected. This could be where you make a fatal error of judgment. Yeah, I've, got, I've sort of hit a point now where I uh, don't really feel that I'm getting that much colder. My feet, feet are really cold, though. Every, everything's really cold. I just feel like moaning, you know. I really do think it's quite psychological 
the cold. You know, you can really make yourself feel colder if you want to. You know, if the old uh, self-esteem's a bit low. The walk has a dramatic effect. You'd think it would warm him up, but the opposite happens. As the blood pumped into his cold arms and legs, it cooled down and his core temperature is now dropping fast. What has been very obvious in the last five to ten minutes is that Mark has been shivering very violently to try to maintain the core temperature. And now he is very obviously suffering uh, and really very, very miserable. My muscles um, have really got stiff around my thighs, hips. I mean, under under my chest here, it's almost like someone's grabbing me, you know. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, I was quite surprised to look at that temperature reading to see it's gone down, you know, 0.3 of a degrees, which is just, you know, quite dramatic considering for the last sort of hour and 15 minutes, it's been at 36.3. So, and I can really feel it, yeah. What would the experts advise? Get out, get, get warm clothing on, because if we stay out, we're going to get into trouble. The doctors decide enough is enough. Mark's core temperature is now only half a degree above hypothermia. Any lower, and he'd really be in the danger zone. Oh, yes. His heartbeat and breathing would slow down. He'd become drowsy and confused, then slide into unconsciousness. Instantly more comfortable. Look at, you can just tell by the <laughs> smile on my face. <laughs> this is bliss. <laughs> oh. If we hadn't stopped now, Mark would have had hypothermia within the hour. Well, why not? The experiment surprised everyone. It showed that the effects of hypothermia can set in quickly. The effects are dramatic, both physically and mentally. If you ignore the signs, your life is in danger. Oh, it's wonderful. Last year, A Flight 22 Squadron was the busiest search and rescue unit in the country. They're on duty 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And in 1998, they were pulled out to an average of five rescues a week. 999 has had exclusive access to their job and the life behind it. Tonight on Search and Rescue, Rocky Bolden and his crew fly through the night on an Atlantic ship rescue. And another ship rescue in the South Atlantic ends badly for Steve Buck Taylor. It's 10.30 in the evening, but it's going to be a sleepless oh, night ahead for A flight. From here? Yeah. 150 from the Scilly. Right, so we need to top up with fuel. Yes, we do. There's a ship on fire about 150 miles off the Scilly Isles with 22 people on board. Uh, we've been tasked to go and aid. Cold droves are also launching to lift them off. Um, but it's a good way out of our area. We're looking at about 200 plus mile transit. So we're concerned at the moment about the fuel availability. We'll probably go straight there, but we've got the option to refuel as we pass Cold Rose. Kit Lost Rescue, Rescue 169. Can that you please give us an update of the actual position of the incident? Over. With the ship's position confirmed as 150 miles southwest of the Scilly Isles, the crew drop into Royal Naval Air Station Cold Rose in Cornwall to pick up extra fuel. The stricken vessel has been laying telephone cables. Below decks, away from the cameras, the ship's crew battle an engine room fire. All non-essential personnel are to be airlifted ashore. Before winchman Paul Trithui is lowered down, a guide rope is dropped to the men below. With Paul Trithui safely on the ship's deck, the winch operator then attempts to lower the strop harnesses. These are essential for the rescue. Two strops attached. Oh, 
and no, I don't believe it, the stress has just come off the hook. No, bloody hell. How on earth did that happen? I've got one long stretch. Winch operator Chris Palgrave acts quickly, improvising a double harness from a spare strop okay. and a specialist seat harness known as a bosun's chair. Oh, it's unwieldy, but right. safe. Bosun's chair, long strop attached. Forward two and right. One and right. Steady there. Left one. The hook is to hand. Move left, but two on the wire. Fill it. There we left it. Two which again. Left one. Okay, steady there. Coming to the door. At the door. Hoist. Two on the wire. With Paul Trathui safely back on board, one of the rescued men explains the situation below. We had some uh, smoke in the engine room. The fire alarm went off. We sealed the engine room. And uh, as of now, no one has been in the engine room. On the way into Keldrose, a call comes in from the ship's captain. The fire seems to have been contained, and uh, everybody is safe and sound. A seven-hour operation with four people rescued, but there are still jobs to do. Eight thousand miles further south, Steve Buck Taylor's Falklands tour has just been cut short. We just uh, heard that Steve Taylor's had a bit of an accident in the in the Falklands. He was being winched on to a Korean fishing boat, uh, a squid jigger, which is um, an amazing boat. If you can imagine uh, a Roman trimaran with uh, all the oars up. And um, there was one on fire down the South Atlantic. Um, the aircraft was called out to help these people. And unfortunately, uh, when putting back down, I believe he, he got caught up in the rigging. We've organized for a training sortie to take place um, and they'll land at Bryce Norton and bring him back that way. It's a worrying time for A flight. They've no idea of Buck's condition. Morning. Hiya. Hi. Uh, when do you want your uh, well, patient? Soon, soon as soon as possible. Is he? Okay. He's not on a stretcher, is he? Uh, I don't believe so. Right. No. So we just need him in his bags, and we'll get him straight on. Yeah. Where's it hurting in your ass? The spine in the either side. X. Obviously, X-rayed it for us. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He looks good. It's uh, it's a relief actually. I, I was fearing the worst, but uh, he's he's all right. Buck will be flown home, but despite his appearance, his injuries are serious enough to give other winchmen food for thought. When something like this happens, it, it does sort of home in, you know, the, the dangers that we do take. And, you know, as, as much as you can, you try not to think about it. Um, you know, you just try and get on with your day-to-day -day job and be as professional as we can. Occasionally, the squadron do receive recognition for the risks they face. Flight Lieutenant Al Potter and his family are in London for a rather important appointment. We're just about to go to Buckingham Palace today um, to receive, I'm receiving the Air Force Cross for my part in the rescue of 10 fishermen off the Sonia Nancy, which is a fishing boat 200 miles off Ireland. I've never been this nervous before, <laughs> ever, I think. Flight Sergeant Pete Joyce is also to be decorated for his part in the same rescue. This photograph was taken by an RAF Nimrod. The Spanish trawler is without power and in danger of being swamped by the 100-foot waves. Far above, the RAF Sea King can just be seen. I'm very aware that the only reason I'm getting it was because there was a cross against my name on that day. I'd be just as proud if it was any other pilot in the SAR Force going here. Meanwhile, back in Devon, Buck Taylor shows his family the video of his accident. What's that, Rachel? Helicopter. It's a helicopter, yeah. And there's Army. Look, he's pressing lots of buttons in the cockpit there, isn't he? He's been very busy. And um, got the call up for a fishing boat on the fire north of th about 30 miles north of Stanley. Um, we found out there was 28 people on board. And he'd had um, a fire in the engine room. As I got to approaching the deck, the, the one obstruction was a large davit about seven or eight foot high from the deck. The next thing I know, the um, the winching kit had snagged on the davit. I just remember falling horizontally, and I landed half on, half off the deck with my head over the side, um, right in the middle of my back. That's 
like a just killed your back. Yeah, just killed my back. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bruised the uh, the lower end of my thoracic spine and sustained soft tissue injuries. But it's going to be a month, perhaps, Where's before that? I'm perhaps fit for work. Who's that there? That's me. What am I doing? Daddy lying down. <laughs> Daddy lying down. It was just pure relief that he's walking. You know, your back's very important, and we're just think, thinking, you know, it could have been so much worse, really. Sometimes I think that Daddy doesn't do that job because I think it's a bit too dangerous for him. But then again, if he enjoys it, I don't really mind. Then he's safe. <laughs> Thankfully, accidents don't happen too often. The safety record of the search and rescue force is incredibly good. We've got a very good aircraft, the crew are well trained, and we do get an enormous backup and a very good service from our engineers. But I look at it from the other viewpoint, actually. Uh, it is so incredibly rewarding. Never ever thought I'd go through this. Amazing. Hampshire police say they're treating as attempted murder an attack on a motorist who was critically injured. Simon Wilmot was driving home from work on the M3 in Hampshire. His doctors were giving him only a 50-50 chance of survival. My dad explained what happened to me, and I just have to say, I just cried because I could not understand the stupidity behind what these people did. I come close to death, which was uh, which is a little bit freaky, if you like, because you know, it just it's one of those things that doesn't happen to me; it happens to the other bloke. I remember uh, leaving work about seven o'clock-ish. I've been working late and I uh, remember driving across the N27 and up the M3 and I was pretty much on autopilot. I had planned to go um, out with a few friends, uh, meet up with my girlfriend and just go down to the pub and have a few drinks and play some pool. I was in the slow lane at the time. I was doing about 70 miles an hour because uh, I had a few points on my license at the time. I must have been driving towards one of the motorway bridges. Um, I really didn't have any thought to look up or check anything. A lump of concrete uh, hit me square in the chest, right on the heart. My left lung collapsed instantly. Uh, the right lung then came out in sympathy, I believe the term is, which means that I couldn't breathe. I immediately veered to the right-hand side, the fast lane of the motorway, uh, and then the car managed to stop somehow. I honestly cannot tell you how. Um, I haven't got a clue. And then I fell unconscious. I was just sitting duck in the fast lane. As I understand, there were about five near misses from cars that had seen me at the last minute and just managed to avoid me. There was one guy who got out and saw what was happening. Uh, fortunately, from my point of view, he was actually an engineer of some sort and had a lot of lights in the back of his car. My parents were told that night that um, the surgeons didn't think they'd actually make it through the night. Being told that sort of news, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine it. Because of the seriousness of my injuries, the police opened uh, an attempted murder inquiry. The police were fantastic. They literally fingerprinted the entire barrier of the bridge itself. As I understand from the police, there were three kids involved in, in my incident. Um, a couple of 14-year-olds and an 11-year-old. They were actually acquitted about seven or eight months later um, due to lack of evidence. It's been 
quite difficult to, to really to get back to, to normal. Um, I still have ish, uh, problems with my heart and my lungs. The whole family were just absolutely phenomenal throughout the entire ordeal. When I look back on it now, without that support, I don't know how I would have got through it.